We wasn't supposed to make it past 25. Joke's on you, we still alive. Throw your hands up in the sky and say, we don't care what people say. Hi, guys. <laughs> the circumstances of your birth are irrelevant. It is what you do with the gift of life that determines who you are. Now, this isn't a quote by an actual person. It's actually Mewtwo, OG Pokemon. Although this is a fictional character, I believe that this quote has immense value. I believe that every individual is born with a particular set of circumstances and situations. It then becomes your responsibility to make the most of your situation. Think of life as a card game. You have good cards, you have bad cards. But ultimately, it is up to you to play your hand accordingly. The circumstances for my birth, like many others, is not straightforward. For example, I was born to very young parents. My mother was 20 years old, and my father was even younger at 19. Now, here's the kicker. They weren't even dating. So I guess you can call me a love child of sorts. <laughs> I also grew up in Chicago in the 90s. Now, some of you might be familiar with Chicago from images in the media, et cetera. But in the 90s, gang violence and illegal activities ran rampant. Needless to say, it wasn't a very ideal place for a young child to grow up. I also grew up looking like me. In America, being black is one strike. Being a black man, that's two strikes. We're inherently scary. Boo. <laughs> but that's not the case. Understanding this about myself, I had to walk a little bit softer than other individuals. I also come from a very, very poor family. I by no means come from a family with means. There were times where me and my mother, we were homeless. We didn't know where our next meals would come from. Sometimes we didn't even know where we would sleep. Needless to say, it made me a little bit anxious about different things I had to go through. I would stress out constantly. I was something of a worry wart. Super anxious yet. But fortunately, I did get a good handful of cards as well. The number one thing I had to my advantage, I loved to study. Studying for me was a game. Now, believe it or not, there was a time before Google. So if you wanted to learn something, you had to ask older people or go to a library, you know, the thing with books. I should also be grateful to my genetics. I was somewhat athletic. I mean, look at me, right? <laughs> now, given my cons, this pro came to be where I felt as though I had nothing to lose. I came from the bottom. Now I'm here. But understanding that about myself, I was willing to make more risk in every situation I went into. No pain, no gain. So, now that you understand a little bit about the cards in my hand, let's look at how I played it out. Using my love of study, I was able to gain entry into Lane Tech College Prep. Now, Lane Tech College Prep is a very, very, very competitive school to get into in Chicago. You have to take a test, it's a whole thing, they check out everything about you. But I studied hard, I passed the test, and I was accepted into that school. By being accepted into Lane Tech, I was able to open up my visibility. Most alumni that come from Lane Tech end up being very successful later in life. So by attending this school, my visibility and my network would be greatly enhanced. Also, by using my athleticism, I joined the track and field team. It might not look like it now, but I was pretty fast back in the day. 
I was one of the top sprinters for my team, as well as one of the top jumpers. And using these abilities, I helped lead my team to three city championships. It's quite a feat. Now, because I had led my team to many different championships, it garnered attention from universities. Coming from my station in life, going to university wasn't even a thought in my mind. However, I used every opportunity I had as a stepping stone from one to the next. And ultimately, I went to university. Now, you're probably asking yourselves now, Deuce, what's the takeaway? Well, I'm not special. I'm just like you. I didn't have any special advantages, no special plan. I'm a really regular person. I mean, look at my clothes. Now, moving a little bit forward in the future, after attending university, I had gained a sense of normalcy. I wanted to take more risk, and I also wanted to broaden my horizons. So, one day, while casually strolling by the study abroad office, I saw a reasonably priced opportunity to come to Japan. That opportunity was called the USA Gai Healy Japan. Now, the deal with this program is that you would come to Japan and you would teach children English, as well as do cultural exchange. Here's a couple examples of that now. My idea of cultural exchange. While on this program, I traveled around the country for about three months, working with children, trying all new food, and having different experiences. However, the most important thing were the connections that I made. It was 2011 when I first came, and this was after the large earthquake in Fukushima. Probably heard about that one. I was working with individuals who had lost everything, and I felt empathy for them. They come from a similar situation of me, of not having a lot. But yet, here in Japanese society, it was enthralling for me to see how the community would come together to help these people. And in my mind, I thought that was a very beautiful thing. There was a lot of merit to that. So, after traveling around the country for three months and seeing all of these different things and having these different experiences, I made a decision in my mind that I would come back to Japan as soon as possible, which I aptly named Mission, move to Japan ASAP. I'm not that clever when it comes to titles. Step one was to apply for the JET program. Now, the JET program, for those of you who are not familiar, is a Japan exchange teaching program. It's government funded, and they send you to various places based on your interest and your skill level. In my case, I was already working with children. It seems like something I could do. So, after talking with my student advisor and learning a little bit about the program on my own, I realized that this was something I could do realistically. So I set to motion, moving around like an RPG or role-playing game for the uninitiated. I gathered all of the necessary equipment, letters of recommendation, statement of uh, intent, etc. And after all of that work, I turned it in. However, things were not that simple. I failed the first time I applied. For the life of me, I couldn't figure it out. My letters of recommendation, perfect. Application, flawless. But I failed. For the life of me, I couldn't figure out why someone with my experience and my expertise, who had played by the rules, still failed. The answer became obviously clear. In high school, I was arrested. Note, I was never convicted of a crime, and in my mind, I was not a criminal. However, this single line of text on a piece of paper seemed to take away everything from me. 
I couldn't figure it out. I felt dejected. I prepared, I studied, I followed the rules accordingly. However, I still failed because of this one line. I thought it was over. Everything I had done up to this point was mute. So what do you do after you fail? Life goes on. It doesn't stop. I continued. I graduated. And like most millennials, I moved back home. I searched for a job every day. However, couldn't find anything. I was sunk into a deep depression. And it killed me to look at my family every day. So ultimately, I ended up finding a job with a company in Minnesota. So I moved away. I couldn't stand to face my family every single day after my failure. Now, there are a couple different things you need to know about self-doubt and depression. It sucks a lot. And people don't really tell you that. It's something that you have to deal with on your own. So while living in Minnesota, in this deep depression, in the coldest winter I've ever had in my life, I received two critical phone calls. In those phone calls, they changed me. The first phone call came from an individual who is named Freeman, Stefan Freeman to be exact, and he's my best friend. We went to high school together, we ran track together, and he's like family for me. So he calls me up, he's, hey, Deuce, how are you doing? Oh man, it sucks, everything's not going right. I felt super horrible about it. But he gave me the wake up call I needed. He told me, Deuce, how can you give up so easily? You've overcome so many things to get to this point now. However, you seem to quit now. I don't understand. Now, it might seem like something very simple in common sense, but for me, that was the call I needed at that time. With that call, I gained confidence. So I started going back to LinkedIn and reaching out to individuals who could help me in my Japan journey. I couldn't tell you how many different emails I had sent out. However, there was one person who replied, and his name was Robert. Robert had a strong connection with the Japan Exchange Teaching Alumni Association in Chicago, my hometown. And he took a request to have a phone call for me. Didn't know me at all, but we sat on the phone for two hours just chatting about my life, how I had gotten up to this point. I told him basically the same story I'm telling you today. And after that two hour phone call, Robert agreed to be my mentor. Now I am armed with a mentor and a reignited flame in me to do the things I need to do to reapply for the JET program. So once again, I get all of my paperwork in order, this time, with the knowledge of my failure. Instead of letting that failure hinder me, I used it as a stepping stone. Needless to say, I applied, I got an interview, and I killed it. However, there was still this tricky line on this piece of paper. You were arrested. I'm sorry, go men nasai. But sometimes, if you really want something, you'll go through the process to figure out how to make it happen. I won't bore you with the legal details and the implications of it all. However, it was quite a lengthy process. I ended up moving back from Chicago, or back from Minnesota, back to Chicago, two months prior in order to fix everything about my paperwork. Two months is a long time, 60 days. 
that 60 phone calls, that 60, hey, how you doing? It's me again. That 60 different conversations about my processes. It might have been a bit excessive. After one week, I'm sure that they were tired of hearing my voice. However, I was persistent. I took a firm step and I made a decision that somehow, some way, I was going to make it in Japan. And they just had to accept it. Obviously, we worked out all of the details. I had my record clean. And I'm able to give you this TEDx talk today. Now, this is something that happened five years ago. And since then, I've had a vast array of life-altering experiences that I'm extremely grateful for. I've taken advantage of every single opportunity presented to me. My current adventure now is I work for the Kansai Tourism Bureau. And the Kansai Tourism Bureau represents 10 prefectures in total here in Kansai. It's now my job to inspire other individuals via social media, via real promotion, to come to this wonderful, wonderful area and hopefully inspire some change in them, even if it's just a simple hello or simply seeing something awe-inspiring. Now, I know I haven't had the opportunity to speak to everyone here, and I might not have that opportunity. However, I know one thing to be true. You're an individual of value. No one can ever take that from you. You've had your own triumphs, your own failures. However, by some miracle, you've made it to this point in time. I know you're probably wondering why they got this guy up here telling you all of these things. But as I've stated before, I'm just like everyone here. Do not let your current situation hinder you from what you can do in the future. Because if a poor kid from Chicago can do it, I believe that anything is possible. And there's nothing anyone else can tell me that will change my mind otherwise. Thank you very much, and good luck to you on your own journeys.